Good morning. Thank you, Jackie, for that kind introduction. Uh, my talk is going to focus on what happens after we swallow the tea. Uh, I'll give some brief comments about the theme, sustainability and preservation, then a brief uh, overview of some tea biochemistry, some of the research challenges we and others face, brief out outline of some new studies, and, and some final closing comments. In terms of sustainability and preservation, um, whether the uh, Emperor Shen Nung discovered tea is, whether that's a fairy tale or not, I don't know, I wasn't there. Um, but he was famous for his uh, emphasis on hygiene, so boiling water back uh, a few thousand years ago made sense, and whether the tea leaf fell into the cup or not, and that's how he discovered it. Certainly, the, we need to uh, preserve and sustain that kind of wisdom. Over the centuries, particularly in China, the traditional use history about tea is uh, both from a perspective of medicine as well as a beverage. When we look at the chemistry of tea, however, it's not very simple. Over a thousand different compounds exist in these leaves. Um, some of the more popular ones include the flavonoids, which I'll focus on primarily, um, the carbohydrate, the tea polysaccharides, are there a variety of amino acids? We've heard about theanine. Um, my new colleague from Taiwan explained about GABA, another amino acid that excites us very much. Uh, there's the CNS stimulation compounds such as uh, caffeine and theobromine. Also, uh, we have some vitamins in there, some minerals in there, and at least 100, if not 300 or 500, aroma compounds. So to um, focus the health effects of tea down to one compound, it's not really feasible. Even though much of the research focuses, for example, on EGCG and the catechins, uh, it, it's a much more complex story than um, that. But let me talk about um, the production as well as the compounds that are produced. So this is a very simplified scheme. Uh, from the tea leaf, if it's uh, steam and dried, we get green tea and we get these uh, compounds shown here on the left. Uh, the one primarily operative is EGCG, the one on the top uh, there, as well as some of the other uh, flavanols. If the leaves are withered and then partially oxidized and dried, we get oolong tea. This creates some unique of compounds shown here in the purple uh, field, where essentially two of those flavanol units are, are hooked together. Uh, we know from digestion that these compounds, in the, uh, I'm showing here the theoflavins and theorubigins, are probably too large for us to digest and absorb by themselves, although that picture is not clear. But typically, they are uh, broken down in order to get the molecular size therefore uh, digestion and absorption. Black tea is fully oxidized and this creates a variety of new chemical compounds, uh, just a few of them shown here in uh, the orange uh, field. Uh, again, these compounds are so large that there is literally no way we can digest them intact. And so they must be digested and before um, absorption occurs. This theme about digestion and absorption, I'll continue later here in my talk. The simply focusing on the phenolic elements of the tea, independent of the carbohydrates and amino acids, is what I'd like to explain uh, briefly. So phytochemicals are simply plant compounds. One of the key uh, categories of phytochemicals are these uh, phenolics. And over 800, excuse me, over 8,000 different phenolics exist. So to, then the question becomes, well, which ones? Which ones are nutritionally important? Which ones are healthy for us? Uh, I should also point out that some phenolics are toxic. So it's not a matter of just all are good for you and go for it. Uh, some are bioactive, but some are toxic. And differentiating that is important. In the um, 
phenolic category, I want to focus primarily on the flavonoid subcategory. Uh, you can see this is one of a number of subcategories, but even in the flavonoid subcategory, to take it another layer of uh, uh, focus lower, it would be the flavanols, and then as it relates to T, it would be the compound show there in the bottom um, red box, catechins, epicatechins, and again, the bottom of those four lists, the epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG, uh, primarily in T, green T primarily. Uh, another way to show this in terms of flavonoids, uh, which we study in our lab and others uh, here at UC Davis, would be the um, flavanols, which are found in cocoa, red wine, apples, green tea. I know it's a hard area to study, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> Much of the work in this flavanol area has been done here at UC Davis in regard to uh, digestion, metabolism, and bioactivity of cocoa uh, flavanols. And I'll use that as my stepping stone here in a minute. So in terms of cocoa polyphenols and their production, well, that's the cocoa pod. And we know from this uh, morning session and other sessions that environmental stress on these plants produces a variety of secondary metabolites in response to drought, sunlight, uh, attack from different pathogens, et cetera. These secondary metabolites are nutritionally active for human beings. In terms of cocoa, it's really the focus had been on minus epicatechin. We know from studies here at UC Davis and elsewhere that these compounds, particularly minus epicatechin, when ingested in appropriate amounts in human beings, can produce these physiological effects improving blood flow, uh, relaxing the muscles around the blood vessels, uh, reducing the stickiness of the platelets, as well as increasing nitric oxide. L let me just take a tangent here to say that we know from the cocoa work and the minus epicatechin work that nitric oxide seems to be the operative focus rather than the popular myth that's been promoted of its antioxidants in the tea where the activity is. Uh, I can agree that in a test tube, in a test tube model, antioxidant activity of tea or cocoa happens. But to think that a test tube model can represent all the different dynamics in the human body and all the different uh, redundancies that we have going on inside of us, to think that I can get that down into a test tube and make a prediction of what happens in there is going on in my body is unfortunately an oversimplification. And while I know that many T labels talk about antioxidant rich, and we see commercials on television about pomegranate juice, for example, fighting antioxidants, unfortunately it's an urban myth in terms of the consistency of the science right now. So while we don't know how these flavanols exactly work, we do uh, focus, at least in terms of vascular effects, on the nitric oxide uh, activity. But the story is more complex. So again, continuing on with the minus epicatechin from the cocoa, uh, this study, which was done here in our Department of Nutrition, uh, gave the pure compound minus epicatechin, and then over a 48-hour period, uh, examined the metabolites that were produced in the blood in uh, humans, mice, and rats. And you can see that very quickly, if you just focus here on this blue area, that very quickly after the ingestion of this parent compound, it is metabolized, some uh, sulfates or glucuronides um, uh, are added in order to cleave the compound apart, and within a day or two, in this case 48 hours, uh, it's excreted in the urine. The real biological activity is happening up here, but the point illustrated here maybe is explained best on this next graph where the minus epicatechin was given to mice, it was given to rats, and it was given to humans. 
and then blood samples were collected and uh, put on an analyzer, HPLC specifically, um, and let's see, if you just look here at the, uh, my, the, yeah, the authentic standards to know what the compounds uh, are in the plasma samples are shown here. You can see that the mice has, have these profiles, rats have this profile, humans have this profile. Well, that's great because uh, let's just take, um, this, this peak is here in human and it's there in a mouse, but wait, it's not in a rat. Uh, look at this. Look at all these metabolites in the mice, that, some of which are there in a rat, but really not, not in human. So, what does that mean? That suggests to us that probably the 20 years past of doing all these T studies in animals may not really represent what happens in human beings because mice metabolize these compounds differently than rats. And both mice and rats metabolize the compounds differently than human beings. Said another way, in order to know the effects of tea or cocoa or these flavanol-rich foods, in order to know these effects in humans, you have to test in humans. Well, that's easy for me to say because I'm blessed to be at UC Davis where we have abundant amount of grant money to do those studies. But a human study can cost 10 to 30 times the amount of money that an animal study ha uh, costs. But is an animal study really all that relevant with our understanding of how the metabolites are different in different species? T polyphenols are not nearly as well established as the cocoa polyphenols. Again, uh, the environmental stresses can impact the tea plant, but a variety of different and much more diverse flavanols are uh, produced. The primary operative one I've mentioned is EGCG. Right? Unfortunately, we have much less understanding of how these metabolites affect the human body compared to our understanding of cocoa. And that really is a uh, focus of research needs when it specifically comes to making health claims or doing any sort of novel research on, let's say, a new type of tea or a new type of tea process that creates unique compounds and what the commercial and proprietary uh, aspects of those discoveries might hold for the companies. EGCG, shown here in the center, is metabolized very quickly, just like minus hepacatechin is. Um, the graphic is quite complex, even I can't follow it sometimes, but suffice it to say that what you put in your mouth is not what is going into your blood because of this metabolism. What you put in your mouth is probably not what is active in your body to do whatever's good for you because of this metabolism. And so our, our view, at least, is that uh, simply studying the pure compounds may not give you a lot of information about what's actually happening mechanistically in the human body. In addition to the flavonoids, let me just point out that other compounds exist in tea, such as the tea polysaccharides, but there's so many, it, again, like the flavanols. Which polysaccharides, how much do you need, how often do you need to take them, and in whom are they most beneficial? It would be crazy to think that one size fits all, that the benefits in males and females are equal, the benefits of old and young are equal, the benefits of people with health conditions versus not health conditions are equal. So um, it depends on a variety of factors. Why is studying CT so challenging? I think I've already made a couple of comments in this regard. What is T becomes the first question. How do we define it? And whether it's processed depends on which compounds actually show up in the, in the T product, which then impact what we ingest, which then impacts our metabolism. So the type of T, the processing method, the, how long is brewed, all of these factors are important. I've 
already mentioned, in order to know the effects in humans, testing must be done in humans. Some additional factors of why uh, T is so challenging. Okay, so here's three women. One is a college student, she's there in the center. She's thinking about mental energy to get through her uh, qualifying exam for her PhD. The one on the bottom left is a mother of one and she's 37 years old, she has a career. She's thinking about is she gonna have another child or not, but she's also starting to face the fact that she's growing older, her bones may be getting weak, her cardiovascular system is not as young as it used to be, and since the number one cause of death in postmenopausal women is cardiovascular disease, um, she thinks about that as well. The woman in the bottom right uh, is enjoying her retirement. And she's also aware of the cardiovascular risk as a postmenopausal woman, as well as the, the bone issues. So do they all benefit from tea? Maybe. Which type? Is it green tea? Is it oolong tea? Is it black tea? How often do they need to take it? How long do they need to brew it? Et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm simply illustrating some of the challenges because if we study one population, does that generalize to the other populations? And that's just simply in females. When we ingest the T catechins, digestion in the uh, digestive tract happens almost immediately. It starts in the mouth where the microbes in the mouth start to process the T polyphenols. Uh, as the compounds go through the digestive tract, they are broken apart and taken into the liver and then further metabolized like I've shown previously. Uh, this is just simply another way of saying that what you put in your mouth is not what's happening in your body. There's transformation and metabolism that occurs. And so simply studying the compound in the tea is a nice first step, but we need to know after that wh what's happening and that becomes uh, quite a challenge. The secondary metabolism by the gut microbes is another issue that's uh, growing in increasing understanding and popularity. So if the compounds in the tea are not digested and absorbed in the small intestine, they get down into the large intestine where we have billions of these microbes living inside of us, and they start chewing on the flavanols and the tea polysaccharides and, uh, that gets absorbed into the body. And so how do we track that? With the relationship between what goes in the mouth and what's active, I think I've already made comments about that. And uh, so let me focus the remaining time of my talk on some exciting new research on tea. Despite all of the challenges that I've identified, I think the research on tea is very exciting and offers a great, great uh, prospect for health and human performance. Uh, this study published in the British Journal of Nutrition in 2015 examined the uh, role of green tea or black tea looking at all-cause mortality, so death from any reason. And um, the, the solid line is the average and the dashed lines are the standard deviations. And you can see for green tea as the consumption goes up, the all-cause mortality goes down to about five cups a day and then it sort of levels out. So basically one cup of green tea per day was associated with a 5% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, mortality 4% lower risk of all-cause mortality. For black tea, the pattern looks a little bit differently. Uh, the pattern is uh, favorable for up to about two to two and a half cups of black tea a day in terms of reducing all-cause mortality and then it really skyrockets once three plus more cups of uh, tea are consumed. However, this is epidemiological, observational data. It does not show cause and effect. Maybe people who drink a lot of green tea also get more sleep. Maybe they eat more fruits and vegetables. Maybe they are more happy and relaxed. And so uh, it's not a cause and effect relationship but it does suggest that drinking tea, whether it be green tea or moderate amounts of black tea every day, is probably a wise practice. 
And um, this study on uh, blood pressure, so a meta-analysis simply aggregates and examines a, a variety of previously stu uh, published studies and looks for patterns. So in uh, this meta-analysis of 13 randomized trials looking at systolic blood pressure, oops, looking at systolic blood pressure, that's the top number or the amount of force when the heart pumps the blood out. Um, the benefit uh, was found for um, those who had their blood pressure in the high normal or high range, right? So ideally we say it's 120 over 80, although with age the, uh, the numbers can drift up appropriately. Um, and I won't get into the new guidelines and all of those considerations, simply to say that if your blood pressure is a little bit high, then this data suggests that um, green, tea green tea consumption can lower it a little bit. So around, if you know, I'm not able to ex explain this whole graphic, but the, the diamond here suggests that from zero it goes down to about minus two or minus three. So a, a drop of two or three millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure. Probably you can get that with regular exercise, more sleep, meditation, uh, medication, et cetera. But green tea is helpful in that regard. Uh, diastolic blood pressure, the bottom number, um, also suggests a favorable impact, again, around two to three millimeters of mercury uh, for a decline. Cancer rates have been an issue of green tea focus for a number of years. And I know we have a very exciting student presentation uh, later today talking about green tea and cancer. Uh, this 11-year study of over 5,000 men and women examined green tea intake. Now this is in Japan where the cup size is different than the cup size here in the United States, right? So they, their cup size is four ounces and this illustrates the difference. So it's basically a half a, half a cup of what we're focused on. They also gathered the smoking data and the cancer rate. And uh, to make a long story short, um, this data shows that as green tea consumption went up, the um, average rate of onset of breast cancer in females increased, while no difference was found in males. Uh, this is important, uh, but the amount of tea per day consumed is also significant. Right, 10 plus cups a day. Now that's four ounce cups. So that would be equivalent of our five cups, eight ounce cups a day, <coughs> was associated with later onset in women, no significant changes in men. This um, study also uh, examined 472 cancer patients. They noted that five or more cups a day uh, showed reduced recurrence after uh, cancer was detected and treated the relapse rate or the recurrence rate was monitored. And so for people that had stages, stages one and two, which are the most mild stages of cancer, there seemed to be a benefit. But once the cancer stage became more severe, you're not really able to treat it with drinking more green tea. Not to say that it's bad, but it's just unlikely to have much of a biological effect. Uh, cognition and mood is important. Uh, 21 peer-reviewed studies suggest that green tea um, helps in reducing anxiety. Uh, there may be some benefits in memory and attention, whether it be the GABA aminobutyric acid, the theanine, or the flavanol effect on blood flow to the brain. We really don't know at this point. But uh, certainly it's important to note the conclusion of the authors that the effects cannot be attributed to a single compound. Theanine is of uh, growing interest in that regard, and uh, we know for theanine that it's an amino acid found in the tea that um, crosses the blood-brain barrier and has activity in our brain. So just maybe another compelling reason to drink um, green tea. Um, lastly, the focus on extracts, taking the, quote, good stuff out of the tea and concentrating it into uh, pills or capsules is important. The biggest uh, study to date on this 
has been done at the University, well, coordinated at the University of Washington. It's a national study funded by NIH here. And um, basically, it's showing that uh, in these postmenopausal women, that taking a capsule equal to five eight ounce cups of green tea can help reduce cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, um, increase HDL cholesterol, reduce LDL cholesterol, and reduce triglycerides, all heart healthy outcomes. Well, that's the science, but maybe it's just more important to focus on how great it is to drink tea. <sighs> and maybe that's the benefit Right? The, the, the psychological benefit, or if you're sharing the tea with good friends and colleagues, the social interaction with tea, the spiritual interaction with tea like we, taught, we heard about yesterday, all of those are not, hard, are, are not easy for me as a nutrition scientist to quantify, but I can accept as a tea lover that they do impact how I feel and possibly how my body functions. So in summary, the chemistry of tea is complex. Uh, the health benefits of tea are challenging to quantify, but the most rigorous studies are suggesting that something is there. Of course, you may think to yourself, why do we need studies? People have known for 5,000 years that tea is good for you. But then it's which, one, which people, how much, how often, and all those things that uh, I've talked about. So it is helpful to do the research, and also I would say, in the United States, if you want to make a health claim, whether it be on television or in advertising or out there on your package, the FDA requires you to have two human studies in order to back up that claim. Otherwise, you're not allowed to make those claims. Tea extracts, I think, are one of the most promising areas for our future. Um, but we have to be careful about uh, toxicity as well as health benefits of concentrating too much in a capsule that's far beyond the benefit of drinking a cup of tea uh, five times a day. And then lastly, enjoying tea is certainly one of life's great pleasures, and that could be where the crux of all of the health benefits of tea lie. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. We have, great, we have somebody lined up for our first question, and um, after we do that, we'll, we'll invite the panel up here to continue the Q&A. Hello. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for giving a presentation on this topic. This is one that I'm very interested in, and I've done a lot of uh, my reading of myself, and as a company, I'm with Sugimoto America, we've done uh, testing on the nutrient content in our different teas as well. Um, so that I can kind of correlate that to the, uh, the reading that I've done. Um, but my question is, you know, you've, I'm aware of the Japanese epidemiological studies. I'm aware of some studies that have been done in the U.S. regarding uh, tea consumption and how it relates to health. And one thing that I've always noticed in all these studies, they talk about um, just tea consumption in general. And uh, one thing that I'm familiar with is the different qualities of tea, the different grade of even the same tea, like say sencha, um, a Japanese green tea. If you have a, a very economical sencha, it's from later harvest leaf. And if you have a higher grade, it's from earlier harvest, like spring harvest. Um, and the caffeine content in those different grades varies so widely that, you know, saying like green tea has less caffeine than black tea, well, you know, it depends on grade. It's like a huge factor. And so I'm wondering with all the other uh, nutrients in the tea, if there are any studies that are being done on the relation of the quality of tea to the uh, nutrient or the health benefits, health benefit effects that you'll get in the body? That's a great question, but first let me say thank you for serving that matcha tea out there in the lobby. Um, whether it be brewed or powdered, we really appreciate that. <clears throat> and to answer your question, no. I'm not familiar with any studies that link the quality of the tea, or as Professor Hahn talked about, whether it's pleasant in your throat or in your body if you feel comfortable uh, w w with the biochemistry and the physiology. 
Uh, that, that, but I do echo what Professor Hahn talked about as the importance of the balance between the catechins and the amino acids so that it both tastes good and is good for you. Uh, Thank you.